Welcome to the final in conversation. Well, thanks, Aaron. Th thanks, thanks, Aaron. Um, I've had an I've had an amazing festival. I've um, it's been fantastic, and we're about to end off with a Saturday sesh. A Saturday Mike. sesh. A Saturday That's right. Sesh it with, is Saturday, and this Mike. is Melbourne, isn't it? Yes. We just established that fact. We're in Melbourne. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because you, um, you, we were just we were just talking in the, um, in the green room. It, home is basically where you lay your hat. Well. Uh, home, well, actually, uh, home is where I am right now. Is in uh, Sydney? No, where I am right now. Oh, right now. Right now. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm amongst friends, aren't I? I think so. I've, I mean, the, to be really honest, this is the whole thing about the, the jazz thing for me. It's a community. And like, you know, it's like, so it's all family. And seriously, when you feel that that's actually the case, which I do with people like yourselves, and in places around Australia and the jazz community, it's home. It's home. Do you remember <laughs> that first um, moment when music found you? Mm, when music found me. Or you found it? No, I, that's, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that before. Well, my father used to play the piano. And uh, it's probably to do with the fact that we grew in this, lived up in this little town in Narawahia, which is a town in New Zealand, a town of 2,000 people. And we didn't have a piano, and uh, my father's, one of my father's sisters needed a place to store her piano. So the piano arrived, and I, he was a pianist. I didn't know this, but he'd play the piano. So you of course, didn't know that your father was a pianist? Well, how would I? He didn't, we were, you know, I mean, he was a part-time pianist. He was a party pianist, we call him, you know, but he could play. And uh, I heard him play, and it's like, because I want to do that, don't I? You often look to your parents, you know, the, the, you get inspired by these things. So that's what probably started it. And he started giving me lessons pretty early on in the piece. That's out of a, a book called Art Chef. Does anyone here ever heard of the Art Chef piano method? No, no. Well, it was a great book. There was a, the great Art Chef piano method and another book that I got later on, but it's called Sharon Peace, the Sharon Peace Boogie Woogie method. So I could play that stuff, you know, boogie woogie and stride piano. That's, what, that's how I started. And the thing was, my father started to teach me this stuff out of the, the Art Chef book, but being the kind of kid I was, I always, you know, as soon as he'd leave the house, I'd be, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd have me on page one and two and trying to get it right. I'd go to the end of the book where all the good stuff was, you know, <laughs> and I never really got into like learning the basics that well, you know, and then unfortunately he died a little bit longer, you know, after that, and so I was left on my own, you know. Um, I, I can maybe talk um, from experience. Uh, how difficult is it for a father to teach? Well, it's probably very difficult. That's that's why I say it. You know, like I mean, he'd, he'd be teach me one or two, and I'd say, I want to get to the good stuff, so I'd go to the back. But another thing about my my period at, at that time, music was everywhere, and like. Uh, you, we didn't make the distinction so much between popular and not popular. It was either good or it wasn't. And like on the radio in New Zealand, we used to have a whole range of music. But that's where I first heard the people that really excited me. Like the, the, the person I heard a lot of was Charlie Coons, because that was kind of the art chef style. And you know, we'd hear that all the time. But then I heard people like Fats Waller. And that just blew me away. Fats Waller was so great. And this is the, the regular radio. You know, you'd, you'd hear Fats Waller, then you might hear Doris Day or somebody, or any of those kind of people. They played jazz on the regular radio? Well, is that jazz? It was, yeah, no, it was <laughs> just music. It was just music in those days. It was just music, you know. And Spike Jones in the City Slickers inspired me. And so one of the things was, I've just started playing. I put a, neighbor, a neighborhood band together with uh, anyone that could play, or anyone that wanted to be part of the band, not anyone that could play, anybody that wanted to be part of the band, if they had anyone, any way of making sound, they were there, they were in it. And so I had a little band. And so I was about 11 at the time, I think, you know, and uh, because we couldn't read music or no, knew nothing, nothing about it, except art, the, the art chef method did talk about chords, so I had a th three chords at my disposal, and we had a trumpet player that could play a scale in B flat or C or something. So we made up our own little pieces, and that's exactly what I'm doing now. The same thing. It's just a continuation. It really is. The continuum, isn't that the, that's the correct word, isn't it? Continuum. So besides um, the world of music, um, what passions or experiences in your life make you? Um, 
the musician that you are, how outside, outside stimuli brought into your life? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I was always a difficult kid. I mean, uh, I was brought up in the Catholic religion. And so the, in the little town I was in in New Zealand, and that's actually an interesting thing. A lot of musicians have a Catholic background, a lot of jazz musicians. And I'm, it's a very, I, I wonder whether it's got something to do with the way you're brought up. You know, I mean, you usually drop it but, you know, when you get a bit older, but maybe it gives you a certain view of the world or a certain view about something. I'm not sure what it is. Somebody should write a thesis on that, you know. You Catholicism know? and jazz. Yeah, well, yeah, seriously, you know, you know, there's something in it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what's in it, but be, that's what a thesis would explore, right, you know. Yeah. yeah, and so like, what, what I was actually trying to say was like there was the Catholic school in this little town, and there was the Protestant school. And at one point there, I remember, I was the champion for the Catholic school, and we had a big knockdown fight. I was the the, 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 the gladiator, and after school, you know, <laughs> both schools kind of got together, and it was a knockdown fight between me and this guy. You know, was, who was it? A guy called Barakat, his name was. I always remember his name. I, th I think he went on to New York and became pretty high in the Ford Modeling Agency or something. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a funny world. I mean, it also in Nar in Narawahia, my neighbour was this Mary opera singer called Inia Tiwiata. I don't know whether anyone's heard of him, but he was like living in, con you know, he was actually in Convent Garden. That's where he lived. His family was in our block, a little block in, in Narawahia. But he was an opera singer, New Zealand's most famous opera singer t before Kiri, you know. So it's, it's, it's interesting how all the stuff, and there was lots of other things like that that kind of connected, you know. So it's been like a big, a, a wonderful dreamlike journey that I've been on. <laughs> How far, and, and did you, you left straight from there to go to the, the U.S.? No, I came here. You went here. to Sydney I, I, first? I got a gig with Johnny O'Keefe. I used to play in Johnny O'Keefe in the, on the rock around the clock, six o'clock, was it rock around, the, was it six o'clock rock or whatever it was. And that was, a, hey, that was fun. It was, it was a bit of a jazz band at that time. Bob Burles played saxophone in the band. And uh, there was a couple of other people, I can't think of their names offhand. But it was good, you know. So how did you how did you get that that job from from a small town? Oh well, I admit what, what happened. Like you know, Kiwis of Kiwis, and there was a, a <laughs> few. Uh, I went to Auckland actually. And there was a guy there called Lockie Jamison who I don't know. Has anyone ever heard of Lockie Jamison here? Because he actually lived in Australia. He was a fabulous drummer, bit of a checkered career. He'd been kicked out of the states for for dope in those days. I think you know, just smoking a joint or something like that. But this, so he'd come to Australia, and he was a bit of a wild man. But I met up with him uh, in Auckland. I was just a kid in short pants, and I remember because he was a guy that first. And I'm, I'm being honest, you know, it's not, it's not, shouldn't be a secret. He was the first guy that got me smoking dope. And I don't smoke dope now. This is a long time ago, so I'll just get that clear. But the thing is, I remember going around to his house this night, and him and his wife, they said, here, smoke some of this. So, and they sat back and, and put on a record, the Sonny Stitt in the New Yorkers. It's a great jazz record. And then they just kind of watched me, and I'm saying, man, this is the best music I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. <laughs> so he taught me quite a bit about, you know, like, because he was, he was also a bit of a vibraphone player. So, yeah, you know, course. so it was good because he, the music he listened to was the music that I've set my whole thing. You know, it was, he was really a, into the hard boppers and he, he lived in Chicago and played with a lot of these cats. You know, I think his, his claim to fame was that he was the second, second best White drummer in Chicago. <laughs> that was his claim to fame. <laughs> um, I'm, I'd be very interested in, um, and someone mentioned it last night when I was um, talking about today. You've spent such a great chunk of time in different places. You've, you've, you've done the um, Australian music scene, um, also the U.S. A bit like Debbie does Dallas, is that what you say? <laughs> and what I'm getting to is the car wash. Uh, no. um, and so, how? What is the Australian scene? I mean, you 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 you've spent time in both, and we we hear about the New York scene. We hear about that. Um, how how does the Australian scene well, measure up? You, well, you, no, the thing is, there is a jazz scene. It's and it goes back like as is evidenced here today. It's like it's a history, and uh, you know, like 
when I first came to Australia, some of the very first people I met, the very first people was Bernie McGann, who's sadly passed away, John Poche, Bob Bertels, and uh, yeah, a couple of other people like that. These are the very first people. That, it was also a saxophone player from the States called, uh, uh, oh, what was his name, Bob, oh God, Bob Gillette. Has anyone ever heard of Bob Gillette? Fabulous player, fabulous player. I mean, he really was a fabulous player, but he kind of, I, he's, I think he may be still alive, I'm not sure, but he's, he's kind of dropped off the scene, but he was a fabulous player. So, the, you know, but that's the scene. These people, their stories, you start talking to other people or other musicians who've heard of them or know their music, and all of a sudden there's a whole history here going on. And that's what the music really is about. It's not about stuff we, we learn in the, in the classroom. It's all great that we're having all this music education. That's fantastic. But the true jazz scene abides in the people who live in here, the music that they make, and sometimes the, 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 the edges get a bit blurred because it might be jazz, it might be rock, you know, whatever. But that's where the jazz scene is. It's the, it's the people who are living here. So there is a scene here. And we're, we're looking good? I love it. <laughs> I've always loved it here. Because to me, it's an interesting thing too, because uh, the Australian approach to life maybe is very jazz-like. I, I feel much more so than, I hate to say it, if there's any English people, I'm not meaning the bad thing, but it seems to be more jazzy than a lot of the Europeans. It seems to be, you know, if there's a culture that's really very follows in the tradition, it's the, it's the Australian thing. She'll be right, mate, give it a go, you know what I'm saying? That's basically what it's about. And that's what jazz has always been about to me. Give it a go, just hey. Because I think there's a, um, quite a big uh, train of thought that New York, London, something overseas has always got to be better than, than, than where it is. Um, certainly amongst my peers, I know there's talk of, you know, I've got to get to New York. I've got to... Well, of course. I've got to, and not, not necessarily um, just for exposure, but just that's where it's happening. And well, it's true also, but I don't think that that's necessarily as true nowadays as it once was. I mean, there's a really thriving creative music scene, jazz, whatever you want to call it, of all shades. And it's been some individuals here have really helped that happen. I mean, it, it's a process, but we tend to kind of not really acknowledge the wonderful people here who have made these things dedicated people, and there's a lot of them. The yeah. Jacksons, for instance, there's a whole family of people that have really done this, you know, and there's lots of people like that, you know, that, that they've, just, they've got this passion, and they want to share this passion with people, and that's what creates a scene, you know. Um, speaking of passions, you... Um you are a pioneer of the electric fusion, electric jazz fusion you know, scene. Wagons passed out, parked outside. Uh, you the, the, your pioneer were <laughs> <or> your wagon. <laughs> when, um, I mean, we can look back and, and, and you can be quoted and be written up uh, pioneers of, of the electric jazz fusion. Were you consciously aware of, that, of those innovations at the time? Like, yes, we're doing this. Or is it a retrospective thing that you look back and go... I don't look back and say that. Other well, people can say that. I'll say it for PR reasons, but I'll only say it because other people have said it. I mean, the thing is you just follow your nose and you do what's coming up to you. You know, like, that's what it's really all about. The whole reason why even... Like, what happened is I was... Uh, there, there was a bit of a... a, a, a uh, revolution. Uh, that was when the Beatles first came on the scene. And I, you know, so all of a sudden, pop music started to become interesting. You know, apart from the Doris days, and we didn't know much about a lot of. I didn't anyway about rhythm and blues at that point. But then the Beatles came along, and that kind of changed everything. It was like, wow, you know, like this music was interesting. And from the Beatles, of course, a whole thing spawned. And then, you know, we started listening to Jimi Hendrix. Then we started listening to people like Little Richard and all that stuff. You know. Although that was there in the rock and roll, the Little Richard stuff, but rock and roll was so simplistic. The rock and roll I played with Johnny O'Keefe and stuff like that, it was, yeah. wasn't much interest in it for a musician like myself, you know, it really wasn't. But then you started to realize, hey, there's people bringing their uh, musical interests and ideas into this music. And to me, that's always been something that I've really admired. And actually, to me, I think it's very important. The audience is very important. To me, I want to play a music that people can actually get. You know, it's, you know that's the... Some, not all musicians are like this. Some musicians play for themselves. Some musicians play for other musicians, blah, blah, blah. I like to play for people. 
but of course I play not just for people, I play for the musicians too. It's like, it's a, but that's, it's that middle ground. And we've all got different, you know, we all emphasize more of this and more of that. Uh, I hope I'm not losing myself. What were we talking about? No, it's about? great. It doesn't matter if you lose yourself. <laughs> it sounds, it's awesome. Um, what, what, I was, what I was asking you is, you know, people hail you as... as um, I was a pointier. Well, that's the same. Well, what happened? So, you know, we'd been playing the stuff just because we're hearing it and we're doing the stuff. And, and we were just blown away by some of the stuff. The Beatles, we, we, they got to be like gods to us at some... You know, because you... To be honest, again, you, that was the days when everyone smoked a lot of dope. You know, that was at least, I say everyone, the people I knew did. And you'd be listening to the Beatles like that. It's like, man, this is like from Mars. This is so great. Because you'd hear stuff, you know, whether you'd imagine it or not, I don't know. But, you know, so you'd, you'd hear it. So then I, I moved out to, uh, uh, to uh, San Francisco. And in San Francisco, there was, jazz was dying. Jazz was dying. The jazz, we started off, I had a little group called the Fourth Way. We started out, as I call it, an accoutric jazz group. Accoutric, I, mean, I thought I was real proud of that name. No one ever seemed to like it. I thought about <laughs> reintroducing it, but no one seems to get it. Accoutric jazz, I thought, you know. Well, so it was a little bit electric. But then there was no places to play. The only places to play in San Francisco was the rock clubs. And just around that time, the Fender Rhodes, someone discovered the Fender Rhodes piano had been around for a while. And uh, I, I met the guy that made it, Howard Rhodes, and we kind of got along. And so the next thing I know, I don't know where I got it from. Maybe he got me one or I got one from the store. I don't know. But I started playing Fender Rhodes and the light bulb went on. All of a sudden, from being a piano player, which is fine, but a lot of the jazz, the piano players, it's like the sound is like, it's smaller. You know, you're not a front person. You, it's changed nowadays, it's all changed. But back then it was like, what you, you know, you, you kind of were hidden. But then I got this Fender Rhodes, and I had an equal voice with the lead, with the, with the violin. You know, I could play one note, and it would be real big. And wow, wow this is fantastic. So it, it made a different way of playing because you, you had to play differently because conceptually it's different. You know, it's, it's a much thicker sound than everything else. So you had to play less and you had to listen. So I guess all the stuff has gone into affect my approach to music. Of course, you know? yeah. So, so it, wasn't, it wasn't a thing about creating something new. It was just like just trying to survive. And, and it was, hey, we can play our music, put it in this box and we can do this. I mean, I was singing at one point, my own songs, you know, you know. You know, I forget the names, you know, but, you know, silly things, but, you know, but that's what we did. It was all about, you know, dancing and grooving and playing music and just having fun with it. Is it still like that? It's still like that. But I don't sing. There's no singing. So if anyone's <laughs> expecting, you know. Have you ever released a you know, vocal album? I actually, at one point, <laughs> at one point, I seriously, because I sung at the Hollywood Palladium with my band. I felt, you know, hey, if I can do that, I've got some balls. The singing was pretty bad. But I, I was going to record for Columbia. But actually, not for Columbia Capital, seriously, but the guys in the band didn't like it at all. But before this, I'd been, or, or might have even been after this, I, I, like a lot of us in those days, even, even Keith Jarrett made a record called Restoration Ruin. Has anyone ever heard this? It's him singing with the guitars and everything. Well, I used to do the same stuff, you know, and I had this, all this stuff. And at one point, I had a manager, and, and uh, this guy from uh, L.A., he was, he, my manager, was really, he, he played the stuff. And this guy, he said, oh, man, the guy was on the phone to him last night. You know, he was crying. He loved it. He was, oh, I was going to be a big star. It was like, it's all going to happen. And so within the space of maybe two or three days, we found out the guy had a massive mental breakdown, and they shipped him off to a mental hospital. So that was the end of my career. <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> I'll stick the blade in the piano after that. <laughs> and also, I mean, I, I did try for a while, but people, I got tired of club owners saying, hey, look, guys, the music's fine, but the singing's got to stop. <laughs> I finally got the message. When the, when the club owners are on yeah, to it, exactly. yeah, it's, a, it's time, it's time. Um, a question I'm, I, I, I think I like to uh, put forward to everyone is, um, how important to you is the balance between uh, recording and performing? The balance? Yeah, so between um, putting out an album as, 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 a, career, as, a, as a musician in a career. Um, and, and, and within that, improvisation, you know, approaching, an, a provo blah, blah, approaching improvisation and a live performance and approaching it for a recording. Is it the same? 
Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, it, I mean, recording is different. Recording definitely is different. I'm not one of those people that, that thinks that uh, the whole idea is to, you know, uh, capture yourself at your most inspired moments, which would be great if it happened. You know, whenever you hear those moments, it's always fantastic. But no, I, I do tend to think of recording a bit more like composition in that sense. It's more studied, and uh, that's what I think, you know. And I think it's a very much an important aspect of a creative musician's life to kind of actually have a constant uh, flow of records. And, I, uh, you know, I've been kind of lucky. I mean, I didn't record a lot when I really wanted to years ago because it was, you felt you were powerless. But in recent days, it's become easier. And now, of course, I've got my own record company, you know. I mean, I did run a record company for a while, and that was quite, quite good. But I'm not a very good businessman. That's the bottom line. Being a, you know, and the whole record business, of course, has changed anyway. But like so many people, we just persist. Like I was having dinner last night with a guy called Ben Hoffman, a guitar player from uh, Sydney. You may have heard of him. And he was saying that he just likes to record. You know, he makes these projects. They don't sell anything. They don't do anything. He just prints them up. And they're, they're really expensive, some of these things. The people put a lot of money into them. But that's what he likes to do. He likes the whole process. When he's finally finished one, he does another one. I'm not quite like that, but I do have a lot of projects that I would really like to document, and then not just document in a dry way. I'd like people to hear this aspects of the music. So it's, it's kind there's of... There's an audience for... The, 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 well, I think there is. Well, even if there's an audience, if there's an audience for my music, there's going to be an audience for the recorded aspects of it. And I do have a new record coming out. This is not a plug for that. But it's, uh, it's, got, it's being mastered here in Melbourne as we speak, I think. Maybe not, but by Philip Rex. So I say maybe not, because it, but it's 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 it could be next week, could be today, could be yesterday. I mean, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's what's happening, and that's a record of my uh, octet, a suite written for, uh, and that again was I didn't instigate this, but I I kind of got asked to write the suite of music and wrote the suite of music, and uh, it's kind of evolved. And now uh, there's a record coming out of it. Um, you commissioned? That, that, yeah, that it was commissioned, yeah, commissioned. Yeah. How do you approach a commissioned work versus you know, like inspiration? Are you a good deadlines man? Well, I mean, you just... Look, I mean, I'm writing all the time anyway. So I just take bits and pieces or whatever, you know, things. I mean, you know, it's like... I write. That's what I do. I write music. It's like playing the piano. I play the piano. I write music, you know. I'm always writing music. So when things come up... There's usually something there that I can kind of use as a starting point if I need to do that. Or I think, oh, wow, that's, wow, this would be great for this thing. You know, and you start working on it. And so, so when, you, when you write, do you have a, um, a project in mind? Or the ideas come and you just they're, they're, you put them down and they're stored for future reference? Like, well, yeah, well, I've always said to anyone that wants to be a composer, keep a notebook. I mean, the only problem is... Like in my case, I've got so many notebooks now, it's like I don't know what the hell I'm doing with the stuff. I can never find, I, can, I can't even find my own songs. I haven't written that many, but I've written enough that I, don't, I have to ask my wife, what's the name of that song? It goes like this. And she can usually tell me because, you know, she remembers. I don't remember. I can't, you know, I'm, I, I think, wow, what's that song? I want to play that song. And where is it? How do I, f I can just remember, remember a few bars of it. So, you know. But it's, uh, I do say that having a notebook is a real big help, particularly when you kind of want to... Because we all forget ideas. So you just write an idea down. But I have so many ideas these days, that's, that's never a problem. It's just a problem of finding, it's, it's, the problem is finding time to work on them. Have you yeah. ever suffered from writer's block? Probably, but not these days. Writer's block is not the problem, you know time to do something with it. Um, do you draw, do you, so for commissioned works and, and things that someone says, right, compose me something, do you draw from um, personal experiences or do you draw from sounds and, and, and the way? I guess it's all personal for me. It's all about an ex trying to express, I, I just think about what these things conjure up. Like I did a piece recently for uh, uh, the Christchurch Festival in New Zealand, and I wanted it to be, I call it vicissitudes. Uh, it's for a classical trio and a jazz trio. Uh, and I just wanted to make some music for the people there to kind of, it's also, in other words, uh, 
connect with them in a way and also take them on a basically a positive journey, you know, just and it seemed to work. You know, we've, it's been played, it's been played a few, a few times now and it was an incredible reaction, you know. But I mean, I, that's it's often happens, you know. It's a, it, music to me, the basic impulse is the emotion. That's, that's where it comes from for me, you know. And how do you feel when you when someone else is playing your compositions? Is it different? Is it frightening? Is it fun? Well, frightening. Is it... It's great. I love, I love it. I just whatever they do with it, hey, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a charge of release to the world. Do, do, do with it what you want. You've never had that moment when that's not quite... Oh, no! <laughs> hey, that's interesting. Wow. You like to do it like that. It's even like I, I've written a lot of classical music in a classical meaning, totally notated music. And there's, there's another plug. Simon Tedeschi, the piano player from Sydney, has just released uh, some uh, CD on uh, on ABC Records with some of my music. And, uh, it, you know, it, it gets played by different piano players. But it's always different than the way I would play it, even though the yeah. notes are the same. It's really different. But sometimes, and, and I, wouldn't, I can't play it like that for one thing, and I wouldn't necessarily want to usually, although Simon comes closest to capturing the rhythmic thing. Often when classical musicians play it, they play it uh, rhythmically. It's a quite a different thing yeah. than I would do. It's just a different concept. But I've done these interesting concerts with this guy from New Zealand called Michael Houston, who has long been acknowledged as one of the top, if not the top, pianist in New Zealand. And we've been doing these series of concerts because he's recorded a lot of my music. And what happens is he'll... Uh, play my music for the first half and I'll sit on stage and make some comments, not about the playing, but just about the piece or something that he goes through. And it's really been wonderful. Like it's been a commentated, sort of commentated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's going to yeah, play right. this piece now and this is like this, you know. And it's really quite special because he's a wonderful pianist. And then I get up and just fall over myself and that's cool too because there's a nice contrast. The only, the only, thing, the only problem happens like at one, we did it once where we got up to play this two hand piece of mine and I'm nervous as hell and it was, it was, it was a diabolical. But you know what? The audience loved it because it's more the fact that they see you trying to do something. And I did a concert with Simon Tedeschi the other day and he said, oh Mike, let's play a, a piece together. You know, and we did the same thing. And again, the audience loved it. And it rose the bar so high that he had to come out and play something. And he did it. And it was like, <laughs> awesome, you know. <laughs> but they love that. People love that because it's about, this is what the jazz thing is to me. It's not about, it's about connecting with people emotionally. And that's part of the, you know, you see people, I mean, a lot of times, classical audience in particular are really amazed that you're just sitting there making it up. And in my case, that's what I am doing. And I, that's what I want to keep doing, making it up. I like that, scary as it is, it doesn't always work. But that's, to me, the real pleasure in doing it, uh, the real challenge in doing it, too. You were um, mentioning uh, before, and I'd, I'd love to bring it up for them, that your performances have, um, are less now and that, you, that you're more writing. And there's a sense of... Um, I don't want to use the word trepidation, but there's, there's um, I think what, what you said, you, you got a little nervous. And as, you know, earlier on in your career when you're performing all the time, it was just what you did. Now there's a lot of composition and stuff and you're, you're actually performing less, but it feels different. Well, it does, and it is scary. But I mean, that's, I, I, look, as you get older, all kinds of things change. For one thing, your memory goes. So, you know, I can't rely on even my own songs, you know, like, I mean, of course, but I've always been like this. That's the interesting thing. It's not just, just recently I'm, my memory's getting worse. I always had a, I, so it's not something that I've worked on. And I always felt one of the things when I started, I kind of got, it, the whole p solo piano thing happened naturally because I wasn't, never considered myself that good a piano player. I always used to consider myself first and foremost a musician. And a piano player was just, I happened to play the piano. And then somehow or other, I kind of got into these, I don't know how it happened, but someone said, would you like to do a solo concert? Or you always say yes to everything, don't you? You, you, you know, <laughs> hey, it's money. <laughs> and it's, so anyway, so I'm saying yes, and it's, it's working. It's okay, you know. And I think I, I heard Herbie Hancock play solo once, and I, it kind of blew me away because this is before I did it myself. And he was just playing like he played with his rhythm section. Same thing. I said, well, hey, I can do that. You know, so I started playing and do a little bit different things. But uh, uh, then that kind of s s started the ball rolling. 
you know, to playing the, the solo piano thing. And, but I, my memory wasn't so good. So I figured, well, if I'm playing original music and I forget it, who cares? No one's going to know. <laughs> and, but seriously, and it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. As long as it doesn't matter to you, as long as you, I can wear it and just kind of go with it, that's what's important. Just follow the thread. That's what's important to the listener, not to whether, oh, he played a wrong note there. Well, hey, he might have played a lot of wrong notes. But if you're in tune, and that's what I do now. I just uh, really like to do that. And sometimes it's, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes, you know, because sometimes, uh, you know, like I played this concert of Gershwin solo music recently, you know. It was a thing with Simon Tedeschi. I haven't played Gershwin music. I, had, I said, the lady said, you want to do the so we want you to do a solo piano concert. I said, great. She said, oh, it's a Gershwin concert, by the way. It's a, it's a special weekend, for, and for mainly classical people, you know. I said, oh, shit, okay. Then I, I thought, oh, I better learn some Gershwin. But then I realized that my whole life I've been playing Gershwin, you know, because a lot of the jazz songs are yeah. Gershwin. Yeah. You know, so I said, well, that's cool. So I'm, I'm playing songs that I actually haven't played for 20, 30, maybe 40 years, maybe even longer. But I mean, I, you know, I've looked at them again, but you think, oh, I'll just, uh, they're there, but they're not always there. And you're playing them and it's like, whoops, you know, <laughs> how do I get here? How do I get out of this? But, you know, if you're playing your own music, it's cool. But it's not so cool if... Uh, if someone else knows music. the melody. Yeah. But yeah. Even, if, even so, you've you got to bluff your way. Yeah. You know, a lot of jazz is about bluffing, and that's not a bad thing. You know, they call it, they call it faking it in the old days. But hey, who cares? As long as you as a listener go on a trip and you enjoy it, who cares? That's part of the creative process. And if it's not like that, then maybe there's not such a creative process you really listen to. I mean, there's any number of musicians that play note perfectly and they've got their stuff down. Personally, no matter how well they play, I don't find that so interesting. I really don't. That's just not what interests me. I like to feel I'm there. Unless the, when you hear a classical musician that knows their stuff really, really well, of course they play the same notes, but the really great ones make you feel as if they're playing it for the first time. That's the key, you know, they're there with it in the, you know, so it's, that's a real special art. But we, we take the shortcut, we take the, e, the you know, the, the lazy man's way to it, you know. <laughs> do, you, do you practice often? Do you have a practice regime? Oh, I practice, practice all regime? the time. I don't have a regime, but I, I, the question is, as you get older, you have more demands on your time. You know, we all know that, I'm sure. And it's really, really hard. I've got so many things to do. But I have to practice because if I don't practice, my, my playing gets worse quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just perhaps some advice. I mean, I know you're, you're an educator as well as... Um, really? As a, yeah, I teach, but I'm a, <laughs> am I an educator? <laughs> um, the career of a, of, of a musician, um, you, you know, sort of crafting a career and really going out there and forging and, who, you know, how shall I do this versus opportunities that present themselves and perhaps not taking everything or should one take it? Just a little bit of advice. Oh, well, I, I don't know about advice. I mean, the thing is I've always just done what I wanted. I mean, even when I was actually real young and had to, you know, put food on the table and all that, just... I mean, I was always discerning about what I took. If I felt I was doing something that was going to affect my playing, my creative playing, too negatively, I wouldn't do it, you know. And interestingly enough, you know, I mean, I, I moved to... Of course, I mean, I was playing with Johnny O'Keefe and all that stuff. This, that's, you do these things really early on, you know, and then you say, oh, no, it's not for me. It's having too bad an effect. Or you get home and you kind of, for some reason, it takes you two or three days to feel right about music again. That's not, good. That's not for me. And when I went to the States, when I first went to the States, I was playing commercial gigs to survive. And then one day I just decided, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just going to play what I want to do. And you know what? Nothing changed, except I wasn't playing commercial gigs. That's the only thing that changed. I was still living exactly the same way. I didn't drop dead. I didn't starve. I didn't get kicked out of my place. I mean, everything changed. Everything was the same. Because I've never really gone after the buck. I was, was working with a singer called Dionne Warwick for a while, for six months, and she offered me quite a bit of money to stay in the gig. And I really liked working with her, but I didn't want to be Dionne Warwick's pianist. I've got my own thing, I want, so I got enough money to buy a Steinway Grand, and that's when I said goodbye. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. Fantastic. Um, that fine line between... Uh, 
self-satisfaction and self-criticism. When you listen back or you think back, are you very critical of yourself? Of course. <laughs> Matter of fact, some of the, my favorite records of my own, I hated them when I first played them. And they've become, some of them have become kind of classics, minor classics, but you know. But, uh, but yeah, you are critical. And I, and I don't particularly want to get rid of that. I mean, you know, I'm not one of those players that just loves everything I do. I don't by any means. I hear it all, you know. Uh, I love what I love, though. When I hear something that's really good, I, I acknowledge it. I don't present, oh, I'm terrible. I don't say that. I've got some things I can do okay, and sometimes it's better than others. But I think you've got to be honest if you want to, if you want to progress. And my goal is to play better, you know? Yeah. And, and some people some say, this, what do you mean play better? You play well enough as it is. I don't get what they mean. Hey, th the whole thing is to try and play better. You know, now they, they may not know what I'm talking about, but I certainly know what I'm talking about. Better means so many things. More comfortable, just more being able to express yourself clearly. That's what the goal is. You know, and that's an ongoing thing. And like technically, that's another thing. Like I just recently uh, came across this book thing called Piano Yoga, which the interesting thing about yoga, this, this piano book on yoga, it, you know, I've, I'm self-taught. I've had a few teachers over the years, but basically I'm self-taught, you know. And so you, you get these ideas that you're supposed to play the piano like this and you're supposed to hold your hand like this or you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. The best teachers I've had just said, just play, just come and just do this, come back next week. And that's what you did, you know, whatever. I, I was playing the Chopin etudes. I didn't know what they were, and I was actually able to play a bunch of them. Of course, I worked my buns off to do that. Well, you know, it wasn't, uh, wasn't just a notion. I really worked real hard. But anyway, I got this book recently called Piano Yoga. And, it, and I love it because whether it's helping or not, I don't know. But the first thing the book's about, like, just to show you, I spent my life playing the piano like this, which most piano players do, you know. But this book is all about playing flat fingers. Flat fingers, the only movement is from the knuckle and, and a loose wrist. And, like, I, I thought, well, that's weird, but then... I realized Herbie Hancock plays like that a lot of the time. Horowitz plays like this. It's, I think this, this lady might be in some way related to Horowitz, but it's kind of an interesting thing. So I've been doing these exercises very, very slow with the metronome and with the flat fingers. And believe me, maybe psychological, but for, one, for a period there, I felt like I was, I'd rediscovered my youth at the piano. There's going to be a whole lot of pianists out there like this at home now. <laughs> <laughs> Just going... <laughs> Well, it's not, it's not that simple, but it is basically that simple, you, yeah. know, you know. Piano yoga. Yeah. Google. <laughs> um, I'd like to open it up uh, to some questions. We've, we have um, some lovely uh, Wheeler Center babes uh, that have microphones, so if you do have a question, just put your hand up and they'll come find you so that we can, everyone can hear. And no one puts their hand up first. No one. No. What? Watch. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Mike, I'm just discovering your, your music and, uh, and um, I'm wondering what your relationship is with your, the other musicians that you play with, in particular your drummer, and, um, and, and w what makes that all work. Which, are you talking about the thing I'm doing today with Lawrence Pike in particular, or any drum in particular? Uh, well, I, I, I have read what you're doing today, and that did interest me, but it's really any drummer um, that plays with you. I'm just really interested in what you get out of the, 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 whole, the whole deal there. Well, I mean, drums, you know, drums are very much a part of the music, you know, because jazz, to me, is really a rhythmic music. It's really based on rhythm, and there's all kinds of ways to approach rhythm and everything else, but to me it's about swinging. Now look, I don't play everything swinging, and then it's like somebody might say, well we play jazz, but not as you know it, Chucky, you know, which is what you might think about the music that Lawrence and I play. But the drummer that I'm working with today, Lawrence, he was a student. We go back a long way. He used to be really into Keith Jarrett when he was about 10 or 12, he had a little trio. I took him to Canada with my band. We've done a lot of playing over the years, and he's in a, uh, I guess you'd call it an alternative rock band now. But he plays a different way. He doesn't play jazz. He does. He'd like to, but he's kind of gone another different path. And he made the suggestion that we should maybe make a record. So we made a record, but we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about the music. We talked about nothing. We just played a bit, and we just went into the studio and just recorded. And uh, 
That's kind of what we're doing now. We still, we talk a little bit about the music, but it's all improvised. But the thing is, what I need is a sensitivity, and he really has that. But not just sensitivity. See, it's like, it's a balance, because I need to be stimulated. So I need, it's like talking. You, with all the music that I play, it's really best if the musicians feel confident enough to kind of put, you know, give their two cents or more. You know, so there's a, so there's a, a conversation going on all the time, ideally. So that's what I look for. Like uh, the, in the last couple of nights, uh, when I was in, I've been in Brisbane, the drummer I took with me is a young kid. He's called Ollie Nelson. He's about 20, I think. He won the James Morrison fellow, uh, scholarship couple, last year, I think. And he's a real good drummer. He's real good. He's, he's got his technique. He's ridiculous, you know. But he's also... And I asked him this question. We had a, we, we, we were just relaxing after the gig. And uh, I said to him, why do you like to play jazz? Because he, he's, you know, like a lot of the young kids, they're into hip hop or whatever. I don't know. What he, I don't even know the names for this music. They do all this different <laughs> stuff, you know, you know. And he said, but, he said, well, he says, you know, because he plays all that stuff. And I, I don't, want, don't know why he plays jazz, because he doesn't really come from the jazz background. His parents are all classical musicians. His whole family is classical musicians. But he said he likes the whole concept of uh, playing in the moment with music. So even though he plays great grooves and all that, you don't, when you're playing the jazz, the, the better jazz, whatever style, it should be about interacting. And to me, uh, that was the right answer. So, well, that's great. That's a great answer. Fantastic. And that's what I look for always with drummers or whatever. The ability to kind of listen to what I'm doing and so we can make something ideally that's better than the sum of the parts, ideally. You know? Anyone else? Yeah, we'll, we'll come to you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Pam. Hello, Mike. Um, my name is Sandra. I'm the mother of two teenage jazz musicians. All right. So I'm very interested in your experience of the National Jazz Awards and as a judge and how that fosters young musicians. Well, I think that, you know, to me, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's like, uh, I mean, I would be freaking out if I had to enter something like that. The generation I'm from, I couldn't do that. I'd be, I'd be freaking out. But I've seen it. Of course, I've been doing it ever pretty much since the beginning. Pretty much. I've done it for a long time. And it's just fantastic to me to see... Well, what I've seen overall happen, it's not related to the, that necessarily, your question, but I've seen overall the, the level of young musicians just getting higher and higher and higher and it's really daunting as an older musician and you know like what happens to a lot of older musicians we start to you know we confidence is one of the things it's hard to maintain confidence I mean a lot of the American players are so full of themselves and all that and that's cool but working with all these young talented musicians keeps you honest uh, which I think is absolutely fantastic in my own case. So the thing is, these young musicians take stuff. Like there was a guy out here recently, Martin Taylor, a gu guitar player. And he, he, I read this in uh, Rhythms magazine. He said he's got students that they, they get to where he is now. 18 years it's, t it's taken him. They get there in 18 months. That's what the young people are doing. They're kind of taking this stuff and just, yeah, they can do it so much quicker and easier than we could. But there's still things to learn. Because basically, the music, as I said before, it's a, the jazz scene is really about community. And you know, there are all these hot shots, which is great, you know. But to me, it's, it's soul sustenance, food for the soul. That's what jazz is. And music really is at its best. It's like you hear it means something to you. It's not just something that sounds good. It's like, wow. And, and in the era I came up, it was probably stronger because there was less distraction. I mean, particularly back in the States, I mean, you know, the music really meant stuff to people. I mean, it really meant stuff to people. I mean, it was like, wow, that fight for it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, just, I don't get that so much because there's so many, there's all these different options, you know. So that's the world we're living in, you know, a bit like the, the brave new world of Aldous Huxley, but, you know. But anyway, I hope that answered your question a little bit. I think there was a question just in the second row here. Just uh, 
Grab the microphone there, thanks. Uh, it's about, uh, thank you very much, first of all. And uh, also uh, interesting moments. And I want to ask you, because you are professional, and uh, you told about solo piano, solo piano, how you can tell, how you decided or determined to tell it's classical or jazz music if you play, if you play slow, very modern music, because I can't, you know? But does it matter? Does it matter what you call it or what does it matter? But if, it's music, if it's music, it's music. You can put a name on oh, it. Oh, it's very high, very high level. Uh, I can't see, you know, end of this. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in a, someone told it's a jazz music and someone told it's classical yeah. music. I can't. So what? So what do you have to know? Do so you have to know? How, how you can decide it? Well, maybe you don't, maybe you can't decide sometimes. A lot of music is... is it's, it's connected? Yeah, yeah. It's about music. It's either, look, it's been said many times, there's only two kinds of music, good or bad. And even that's debatable, isn't it? <laughs> because, the, you know, one man's meat is another man's poison. So, uh, you know, that's the, what I, all I say about that. If someone wants to bring that up, I say, well, look, you know, don't worry about it. Okay. If you okay. like the music, you'll like it. You know. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, thank, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> we got a question just up the back. Hi, Mike. Hi, Miriam, Miriam. here. Um, I spoke to someone recently who said that he was a musician in the 70s and um, he's noticed a big difference between then and now. He said they could really play like hell back then, but they didn't know how to navigate their way to the end of a sentence when they were talking about music. I don't imagine you've ever had that problem, but <laughs> have you noticed a difference in the way musicians are able to articulate what they're doing? And do you think that's had an effect that leads into what you were saying about people being able to pick things up faster? Well, possibly. I mean, we're living in a different age. This is, isn't this called the age of information? Isn't that, isn't that what they call it? I mean, you know, the information is everywhere. You know, you get, you can, there's so much information. We're it's like the Tower of Babel. Everyone's speaking, but no one's really listening or understanding. There is a lot of information out there. So, uh, yeah, uh, what gives rise to it? I mean, all I can think of is in the era I came up and the musicians I played with, we never spoke about the music except in emotional terms. You know, like Tony Williams, a great jazz drummer, was a very good friend of mine in the early days when I was in the States. And he'd listen to records and he'd say things, hear what he's saying, hear what he's saying, not what he's doing, hear what he's saying, hear what the emotional, hear what he's saying. That's what it's, it's, it's really emotional. That's kind of, I hear a lot now with, with a lot of the musicians, they don't, it's a different world. I don't hear that many musicians that emotionally connected to the music in that depth, because we're very facile. We have all this facility, we can do all this stuff. It's, a lot of it's head of me, oh, we play like this sort of guy now, this and that, and I can explain it all because it's all, you know, they've learned stuff, you know, you've got all the books. Maybe these guys knew what, they, they did know what they were doing, but whether they, it was not important to explain it, except you just did it. You know, and in the case of certain drummers, you just did it and did it and did it. That's a drum joke, uh, but you know, anyway. You, you know that you're the first, you're the first of my guests to make a, to make a music pun. <laughs> well done. First and the last too, yeah, I guess. That's it. <laughs> um, I hope that, I hope that answered. Do we have any, any further questions, anyone? Does that answer I, your question or not? Oh, good. Well, I mean, I'd like to touch on um, something that intrigues me, um, prepared pianos, and um, how you personally chose, or did you, did you seek out certain effects and, and certain things, or was it purely experimentation like a little kid in a toy store? Uh, well, I've never really 
paid much attention to I've never actually uh, prepared a piano, believe it or not. I love sounds. I love exploring sounds and all that stuff. But I've just never gone down that route. It's just like, why? I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, you can do it electronically in some ways, you know, which, which I've done a lot, you know, using different sounds. But I've never actually, I mean, some of my music is totally atonal. It's been done by, like I had one of the early ring modulators. I used to play that way back when. And that kind of gives the effect of like really random notes and everything, you know, and it gives you a real sense of real freedom because you don't have to worry about melodies, harmonies or anything. It's just, it's all rhythm, which is cool. But, so, but I really don't know that much about prepared piano. I mean, I, I really enjoy a lot of John Cage's music, you know, uh, but that's about the extent of, you know. Awesome. <laughs> I have some quick fires. So, um, if there are no further questions, I might um, do my, do my quickfire. So, if you could learn a new skill, anything at all, what would it be? To play the piano better. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I'm still, trying to get, I'm still trying to get on top of some of this stuff. I mean, you know. But that's not a new skill. No, that's it's added true. Skills. That's an, okay, all right. A new you skill. You can't wiggle your way out of it, sorry. <laughs> Right, we'll come, uh, we'll, we'll come, I'm a we'll come back to it. What can I say? We'll come back to you it. Know? What was the last thing you listened to for leisure? Well, that's a good question too. Because uh, it's all, it's, it's, it's all, all of a oneness to me. Was it the in-flight entertainment? No, <laughs> in -flight. that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't be the case. No. I, I guess. Do, you, do you have an iPod? Do you listen? Do you know, no. You, you don't. No. It's a, you sit down and, and make time to listen to well, things. Well, like I get so many CDs sent to me and stuff like that. And actually, like the, the, on the way to the airport, uh, we were playing the CD that this friend of mine from New Zealand, a guy called Jonathan Cravett, who's an incredible musician, and he's, he, he's a citizen of the world. He happens to be a very good friend of Barney McCall's. You all know Barney McCall, I assume. Anyway, uh, Jonathan and him have shared gigs, and Jonathan's right now in, in somewhere or another. On the way to the airport uh, uh, back in Sydney, the, the bass player had put on uh, Jonathan's new CD, which is called Dark Light, which is the name of a song of mine, but it's not my song. He's like, hey, John, you, you stole my title. That's, that's beside the point. It's, it's one of my favorite CDs that I've heard in recent years. You know, it's a wonderful record. And uh, anyway, we were talking about, about him, uh, you know, we put this on, and Barney, I met Barney at, at, at the restaurant yesterday morning. He just stepped off the plane from Wellington. Barney McCauley, he lives in New York, of course, and, he's, and we were, I'm eating breakfast, or just finishing, and I'm waiting for someone else, and there's Barney. So we're talking, and of course, the, the talk goes to Jonathan, because they're very, t very tight, you know. And so we're talking about Jonathan. I go up to my room, and what do I get? I get an email from Jonathan, He's been listening to my record. He's, a, he's in Europe. He says, I've just been driving across Italy, listening to Dark and, not Dark and Curious. Uh, Dark, you, you, stole my, you stole my song name. <laughs> Is that what he said? No, no, no. no. It's just funny that the connections, you know. So you asked what I listen to, to for leisure. I like to listen to music of my friends, you know, and I also like a lot of other music, but, you know, it's just, I'm listening to music all the time, one way or another. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. Um, if you were a standard, what would you be? <laughs> if I'm a standard, wow. <laughs> For some reason, uh, the first thing that comes up is round midnight. Ah. But, but, that's, but that's just, there's no thought involved in that. No, that's, yeah. that's, that's good enough. And my last question, which I, I'm, I find, um, can either, you may not have one, or do you have an off-stage ritual or a little something before no. you go on? You just get on there? No, I just get yeah. on there and see what happens. Just play the music. Well, the thing is, you know, like, I mean, as far as playing and all that stuff goes, I mean, I do just try to, I do try to keep an open mind because, you know, sometimes you, you never know what's going to happen. But if you've got a plan, I find you're going to probably be disappointed. The plan's not going to, you get something's going to happen and you're going to mess it up and all that's going to blow the whole thing. I just try to be open 
and just take what I get, take what the, you know, whatever comes, and just try to run with that. that that's my m ritual, if anything. Try to keep the mind open. Have you ever had that moment? You know, have you ever been frustrated by a gig and it hasn't gone? Perhaps. Oh, are you kidding me? Are you joking? I mean, one. <laughs> well, well, this is a funny story, but I'll tell you because it's a good way to end. You know, I was doing this piano solo concert in um, upstate New York one hot summer's night, and it was really kind of a hard gig anyway because it was in an opera house and. I, a hundred year old opera house and the floors had been sloping and so it was so bad that even the stage that the, they had bricks under one side of the piano and, and the stool was kind of it was kind of weird because the piano is like on an angle like this and, and you're trying to do this thing and a solo piano which is can be quite demanding anyway I play the first set you know and I come back to play the second set and they're still there. I said, wow, because, you know, I thought, wow. I mean, you know, I thought they would have all left, but they didn't. The place is still full. And I start playing, and then the thing that happens, that one of the performers' dread, or my dread anyway, I'm talking, I'm, I'm playing, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing talking, and the talking gets louder. And there's this whole conversation going on, and I'm, at this time, I'm so insecure that all I can think about is, my God, what's happening? So I'm just, I played that, that set as fast as I could. I just wanted to get, I didn't stop for anything. I just kept playing, <laughs> playing, playing. And, you know, the, finally at the end, they seemed to applaud and all the rest of it. But they had a special little uh, meeting downstairs, you know, like a little get-together after the concert, you know, for the local music society or something. And I was talking to some people and found out what had actually happened. Because it was a hot night and it's upstate New York and it was an old building, they had the windows open. And these two bats had gotten in. And one, of, <laughs> and one of the bats had perched up beside me. It was like Count Dracula. <laughs> you know, so that started the conversation. And then the bats started dive bombing the audience. So <laughs> I'm totally oblivious to this. I'm just, all, I'm, all I know is there's all this talk going. I've really lost them. You know? So I'm just trying to play. This is a nightmare, you know. <laughs> And, well, I found out, of course, it was all cool, but wow. As the steam came off the right. piano from your fingers playing so fast. Well, I hope um, it's a closed venue tonight, your show, right? Closed? No bats? <laughs> You don't uh, have bats in Melbourne, do you? I do, we, we do. Don't get me oh, nervous. No, we do. Don't get me nervous. We have bats in Melbourne. I don't think they will be allowed in at the, oh, at the Miltard. Like they, they don't allow those types in. Well, that's good. Uh, um, into jazz concert here. But um, tell us a little bit about tonight. We've got a, we've got a few minutes um, left. Uh, tonight's experience at the, the Miltard well, the uh, series. Well, of course, we've got uh, Julian Wilson playing with, with my favourite Barney McCall and my other favourite... Um, well, Alan, Alan Browns, who has who's been quite ill, and he, but he couldn't he, he couldn't make the gig in Brisbane last night. They won't let him fly, but he's uh, happily enough he's on the gig today. He's going to be that's going to be really fantastic, because they made that beautiful record called This Is Always with Jonathan Swartz on the bass. It's a beautiful record, and I imagine they're going to I don't know what they're going to play, but maybe they'll play that. And me and Lawrence Pike, we're opening the show with uh, this thing that oh, we've only done it once in public. And it was fantastic. It was a packed house in, in some little place in Sydney. It was great. Actually, I have to say, we played opposite Joe Chimjama that night, and another, he was playing in another venue, and we got more people than he did. <laughs> That's kind of a joke, nasty joke. But actually, our music is totally the opposite to Joe's. It's totally abstract, and it's... Uh, in the moment, we just make it up. But we're, we're, it's, it's not just piano and drums. Lawrence is playing a sampler uh, made by Korg, that he's been working on, and he's got a lot of samples in it of us playing. So it's a kind of a, it's very orchestral, but in a very uh, different, a modern space age way. And I've got a, I won't be using it tonight because it's, I couldn't travel with it, but they've got me a Wurlitzer, and it's going through all kinds of electronic devices. So it's, we've got a lot of sound sources that, so the music, I don't know what the music's gonna be, but uh, it's gonna be, I, It'll be interesting. I, it's, it's like you don't know what it's going to be. So, but that's where it starts. It'll be batty. No, it won't be batty. I hope not. Come on. Did Come you guys on. get it? No, 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 no. I, I don't get, get that. He didn't get it. I don't get that. I don't know what you mean, batty. The bats. You mean I don't understand. You mean batty crazy? It's not going to be crazy. This is beautiful. See, I'm not going to go with her. You know. <laughs> oh, I made a bad music pun. <laughs> You said there wasn't going to be any I said there music. wasn't going to be, and I did, I did it myself. Um, Mike, thank you so much for coming and um, making puns with <laughs> me this afternoon. Um, 
And thank you for closing uh, the In Conversation uh, section of the festival oh, in fine style. thank you for letting style. me close it. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Knott. Thank you. Superb. <laughs>